Yale and she is a PhD candidate at Cambridge. Daphne is also the founder of the Embracing Our Monuments in Sparta initiative and is the Vyazuma ambassador to the ancient theater of Sparta. Her topic today will focus on public archeology span and cultural heritage preservation in the Evrotas Valley. Uh, just a reminder to everybody that for the duration of the lecture, um, participants' cameras will be switched off and their audio muted so that Daphne is not accidentally interrupted and to avoid lag. Uh, if this hasn't happened already, please turn off your camera and mute your microphone manually. Also, for anyone who might have any questions, please hold them until the end of the webinar when you might type them into the Zoom chat found below or on the right of your screen uh, or on Facebook on the live stream where I will read out a few so that Daphne might answer depending on the time. I'd like to now welcome Daphne to begin her lecture. Thank you so much, Mithyavi. It's uh, such a pleasure to be able to be here. Um, I'm gonna try to share my PowerPoint with you guys. So just give me a moment. Um, there we go. Can you guys see that? Okay. So, Kalimera. Kalispera, good morning, good afternoon, um, and good evening to our global audience. Uh, thank you so much, Mithyavi, for this extremely generous introduction, um, and above all, for the invitation to speak today um, to the Pan-Laconian Brotherhood of Melbourne and Victoria, Leonidas, um, in honor of 2,500 years after the Battle of Thermopylae. Um, the opportunity to speak to fellow Laconians in Australia is particularly meaningful for me as six of my grandfather's siblings migrated to Melbourne um, in the 1960s. Uh, a special greeting is therefore owed to all the Darwi and Zafirake in the audience. El piso na bores men alexana pume tu krono pali, to kapi meno mas horyo, karies la konias, kena horeps me pali mas dika da taplatanya. So, thank you guys. Um, Spartan archaeology um, is a very personal story for me, in addition to being an academic one. Um, and it's one that I'm honored to share with you um, today. And the reason for this is that growing up, I had the enormous privilege to visit Sparta every summer, um, to be immersed in her way of life, to be overfed by my grandmother, but above all, to be surrounded by Sparta's archeological sites and artifacts. Um, their magic and mystery touched me from a young age. Um, above all, I was motivated in my studies by a nagging sense that there was more to Sparta than met the eye. Um, that despite her legendary name rivaled only in fame by Athens, that there was more to be uncovered. Um, and this drove me to pursue the academic career which defines me today, first at Yale, um, studying art history and classics, and now at Cambridge, um, where I'm embarking on my PhD, focusing on the art of archaic Sparta. Um, but in addition to my scholarly interest, I'm also committed to communicating the value of these treasures of our cultural heritage um, to the community of Sparta, to its visitors and to a global audience. Um, in the 21st century, there's still a lot to be learned from these sites, uh, from the stones and traces of human life from 2,500 years ago. Um, and there is most importantly, a lot to be done in order for this knowledge to be shared. Um, so today's presentation will be split into two parts. Uh, the first will be a sort of whirlwind tour of Sparta's most well-known archeological sites uh, and important finds. Um, I should state at the outset that this is not a scholarly presentation, but rather one aimed at the general public, um, one that presents uh, archeology span and cultural heritage of a place that I know is near and dear to all of our hearts, that is Laponia. Um, and I'm aware Melbourne is in under quite a strict lockdown right now. Um, so the hope is that uh, this will provide a form of temporal and geographic escapism, um, while also painting a rich picture of past and current excavations. Um, the second part of my talk will focus on heritage preservation, uh, presenting the new exciting projects currently being undertaken by the archeological effort, uh, the Severus Narcos Foundation, Yazuma Association, um, the Embracing Our Monuments in Sparta initiative, as well as the Amicleon Research Project. Um, so this is without a doubt a period of particular dynamism um, for Sparta's cultural heritage. And I will also discuss how each of us can contribute 
um, as well as opportunities to make a difference. So without further ado, then let us begin. Um, okay. South of Sparta, situated on a hill known as Ayos Vasilios, near the village of Xirokabi, the remains of an enormous Mycenaean palace complex, rich in finds, were discovered in 2008. The site is exceptional, for it is the only Mycenaean palace complex to have been uncovered in Laconia to the state. Um, Archaeological research has revealed that the site functioned as a palace complex starting in the 17th century BCE, continuing to grow in size and importance from the 16th to the 14th centuries until its fiery demise at the end of the 14th or beginning of the 13th century BCE. This fiery demise, coincidentally, is precisely the reason for the preservation of some of the most fascinating finds. Um, an entire archive of Linear B tablets, one of which you see here at left in its context. Um, and Linear B, I should say, is a syllabic script which was used for writing Mycenaean Greek. And it's the earliest attested form of the Greek language. Um, and so these clay tablets with Mycenaean uh, Linear B writing on them were actually fired during the palace's destruction. And that's the reason for their preservation. Um, most of the tablets seem to be of a bureaucratic function. Um, so they were used by the palace administration to keep track of property, um, to keep track of goods, and some also seem to be of a religious nature. Uh, a second spectacular find is the cache of bronze swords, which you see at right. Um, and I still remember actually going to the initial presentation of this find um, by the director of the excavations of Amadia Vasilogambru, um, who presented the first results on the hill and sort of the hush that fell over the crowd at the site, at the sight of them. Um, so these speak without a doubt to the military prowess and dominance of the palace elite. Other finds which speak to the flourishing wealth and influence of the Laconian Mycenaean palace include vibrantly colored fragments of wall paintings, gold leaf jewelry, Egyptian scarabs, seals on precious so stones, and finds associated with cult, such as um, this wonderfully decorated bull's head riton at left, um, which could have been used for pouring libation to the gods. So excavations are continuing at the site, and we all eagerly await to see what exciting new insights they can provide. Um, and once they're completed, the site, the site will be accessible to the public. Um, so we'll all be able to visit it on our next trip to Sparti. Next, moving eastwards on the right bank of the Avrotas, some six kilometers south of Sparta, besides the modern village of Afyo, lies an enormous Tholos tomb. It is the largest Mycenaean tomb ever to have been excavated in Laconia, with a dromos, which is um, the passage that leads to the Tholos of 29.8 meters um, and a width ranging from 3.18 to 3.45 meters. So just try to imagine that. And it's really enormous dimensions. Um, the diameter of the Tholos itself is 10.2 meters. Uh, the famous German archeologist Heinrich Schliemann, uncoverer of Troy overlooked this tomb um, because he believed it to be in a too ruinous of a state due to looting. Um, but Greek archaeologist Christos Tsoudas, excavating in 1889, quickly realized its value um, from the finds, and in particular, the famous golden cups, which I will discuss in a moment. Um, in terms of structure, it's worth noting that the material and techniques of the Tom's construction, both of high caliber, suggest it was designed and built with um, competitive social display in mind. So we might think of the pyramids of Giza, uh, with each pharaoh trying to do the other in terms of size. Uh, the Lord of Vafio, whoever he may have been, did a pretty exceptional job as this Tholos tomb ranks in the top 25% of Tholos tombs built um, in the late Hellenic II period, which is 1450 to 1400 BCE. Interestingly enough, its orientation seems also to have been of special significance uh, with the co-occurrence of two sight lines the view of Profitis Tileas, the highest peak of the Taitos Mountains on the west, 
um, and an orientation to the summer solstice sunrise in the east. Uh, in terms of finds, the most famous displayed today in the National Archaeological Museum of Athens are the gold repoussé cups known as the Vafio cups, one depicting a violent scene of bull capture and the other a calmer one of bulls being tethered. The cups were found in an undisturbed burial pit, and although the skeleton disintegrated, their positioning has led archaeologists to suggest that each one would have been held in the hand of the deceased. Um, their iconography, which is to say the images which are depicted, is remarkable for its movement, its dynamism, and its composition, all with meticulous attention to detail. My favorite details are the careful articulation of the leaves on the olive tree, which you can see here at left, and the sinuous muscles of the elegant male figure at right, captured in a moment of strain. On the more violent cup, uh, an exceptional detail is the gaze of the bulls, which breaks out of the frame of the representation to meet our own gaze, um, that of the drinker or of the viewer. It really should come as no surprise, therefore, that the cups also make a guest appearance in the blockbuster series Game of Thrones. They really just are that epic. Um, next, let's move to the Parnon mountain range uh, and its flanks of russet colored hills upon which the sun sets every evening in Sparta. It is on one of these hillocks high above the east bank of the Avrotas, about three kilometers east, southeast of modern Sparta that the Menelion lies the cult site for the worship of the mythic couple, Menelaus, king of Sparta and beautiful Helen. Its excavation has been taken up largely by the British, first in 1909 by Droop, Thompson and Wace, and later in the 1970s by an excavation team led by Hector, the late Hector Catling. Uh, the Menelion was one of the first classical sites to attract attention in the vicinity of Sparta. Sudas and his excavations on the site at the end of the 19th century was also the first to identify Bronze Age occupation not far from the shrine itself. Remains at the Menelion suggest continuous use over a period of seven centuries, during which the structure, consisting of a large conglomerate platform surrounding a high foundation for a monumental altar, served as the focus of worship. It seems to be the case that the cult of Menelaus and Helen was created out of a sort of deliberate nostalgia uh, for a heroic past and desire for alignment with it. Um, and this also functions well chronologically um, with the circulation of the Homeric poems which situate the palace in Sparta uh, and would have been circulating at this time. Uh, the slide I'm using for the background of today's presentation is actually taken from the Menelaion looking west towards the Taillietos, which gives you a sense of the remarkable view from the sites. We must imagine that the site itself would have been visible from the Avrotas and the valley beyond, a constant reminder and signpost of the mythic presence of the couple in the Lakotian landscape. How do we know that worship for Helen and Menelaos actually took place here? Well, in fact, we're lucky enough to have a number of inscribed objects which speak to dedication practices. Here on the left, you see a bronze aribalos, which would have been used for oil or perfumes dedicated to Helen. Uh, the inscription reads, Vinis dedicated these to Helen, wife of Menelaus. And the name Vinis, interestingly enough, is a male name, uh, which complicates perceptions that Helen is the most beautiful woman of Greece as the face that launched a thousand ships and started the Trojan War would only have been uh, worshiped by males. I'm oh, sorry, by females. She was in fact also worshiped by males. Uh, and on the far right, you see a bronze harpax, a sort of grappling hook. It's not very Helen-like if you ask me, but the inscription reads to Helen, Eleni, in the ancient Greek dative case. Uh, in the center, you have a drawing of what's actually a stele of blue limestone. Uh, which you must imagine is carrying a bronze statuette on top above the inscription. Uh, and it's inscribed as a dedication for Menelaus. What's particularly interesting about these finds is that the dedication, the dedication is not directed towards Helen and Menelaus as a couple, 
Um, but instead the dedicant seems to be selecting one of the two. This led Catling in 1976 to point out that it's possible they each had their own separate altar on the site. But what's most significant in any case, and the key takeaway is that Sparta was keenly aware of and sought to emphasize its own relation to a heroic past, a theme which was common in the Greek world at the time. The remains of the Mycenaean mansions excavated by Tsudas not far from the archaic cult site suggest the choice of location for the Menelion was far from co coincidental, but sought instead to establish a link um, with these prior heroic remains of ancestors past. So let me take a moment now here, excuse me, sorry, uh, to resituate ourselves chronologically as we move from the Mycenaean period more to the archaic and the classical. Uh, for the final three sites which I'll be presenting, I'll be focusing on the major sanctuaries of archaic and classical Sparta, a sort of holy trinity or trifecta, um, if you will. I'm sorry, one moment, the phone is ringing. Okay, I will ignore it. Um, a sort of holy trinity or trifecta, if you will. So the sanctuary of Athena Chalkiikos, the sanctuary of Artemis Orthia and the Amicleon, or sanctuary of Apollo Amicleos will be the focus of my final three slides. Um, and these sanctuaries, I must emphasize, serve as the three poles uh, around which Spartan religious life seems to have revolved. Um, although many details of this, if we put hypothesis and conjecture aside, are still murky. Um, as this talk is focused on archeology, span I'll emphasize the different finds, which in turn may provide clues about dedication practices and the nature of cult at each of the sites. Athena Chalkiikos of the bronze house perched on the Spartan necropolis seems to have been most focused on civic matters, whether with regards to politics or warfare. Um, and this is also attested in the first name of the, of the goddess on the site, which is Poliukos, meaning guardian of the city. So it's not only Athens, in fact, who had Athena as a civic deity, but Sparta as well. Unfortunately, due to extensive looting during leading, later periods, only the foundations of the temple remain today. And that's what you see depicted here in these two photos. Um, but really, I see this- Even the stone. A, a provocative invitation um, to imagine the temple's a, a, a characteristic decoration. And we're actually quite lucky because in the second century BCE, the travel writer Pausanias actually visits Sparta and he visits the site of Athena Chalkikos and he tells us of the bronze panels fashioned by the Spartan sculptor Yithiadas, decorated with scenes of the labors of Heracles, the birth of Athena and the abduction of the Leucipidae by the sons of the legendary Spartan king Tyndareus, which would have decorated them. So we have to imagine these foundations here rising up and being decorated by these bronze panels and the glint that they would have had as the sun shone on them and how imposing they would have been for someone approaching. Um, and the sanctuary of Athena Chalkikos actually also makes an appearance in the history of the Peloponnesian War as told by the historian Thucydides. Um, and he recounts how in 470 BCE, the Spartan king Pausanias sought refuge in the temple. Uh, he ran inside and was shut inside a chamber by the pursuing ephors, who had accused him of Medizing, being on the side of the Persians. Unable to commit sacrilege, however, by killing him inside the temple, instead they choose to remove the roof of the chamber in which he was hiding, exposing him to the elements, and they build him in so he can't go out. He's starving to death. At the very last minute before he's about to die, they drag him out of the temple and he dies on the steps. And so in this way, they don't pollute the sacred space of Athena, but they still achieve um, the death of this uh, Spartan king who they considered a traitor. Um, and on the next slide, I have two of my favorite objects, which were found at Athena Chalkikos. And I was actually just in Sparta a couple of days ago and I took a little video for you all, um, which is of the so-called Leonida sculpture, which you see depicted here on left. Um, that was found in 1925 and the workmen were so enthused um, by this masterpiece of a hoplite that they named him Leonidas, although 
um, the archaeological evidence is not actually secure for this. It would have been quite unusual um, to have a political person depicted in this way during the time period. So if you watch the video, um, what I want you to pay attention to are the details of the sculpture because it really is marvelous. Um, oh, started from the beginning. You can see on his cheek um, that he actually has uh, a ram that's uh, depicted and on his beard you see the striations in the marble um, that sort of depict this facial hair and his eyes would probably have been inlaid with a precious material. Um, you can see the incisions on the helmet, um, it's elegant modeling and also the modeling of his body um, and it appears like he's leaning forward perhaps lun lunging forward. We can imagine maybe his left arm stretched out, holding a spear, his right arm closer to his body, perhaps holding a shield. Um, and as the, the camera loops around, um, you can also see the musculature on his back and the way that it's carefully articulated, his spine. Um, it's really naturalistic, meaning that it really seemed, they're trying to make it as realistic as possible as if he's alive. Um, and this is one of my favorite details. It's little curls that are visible under his helmet. It's such a nice detail. Um, so yeah, for those who say that Sparta doesn't have art, I think you just need to show them this video. Um, and then there's not much that they can say in response. Uh, and of course, it's also Leonidas is the, the name of your society. So this is your sculpture in a sense. Um, and so on the right, we have another object of exceptional interest. It's a Panathenaic amphora. These were the vessels which were given to victors of the Panathenaic games, yes, in Athens and our supposed rival. Um, and so this was actually found dedicated at the temple of Athena Chalkikos, um, which tells us that the victor was a Spartan victor. He won the quadriga, the four horse chariot race, which you see depicted in Athens. Um, and he, this, this vessel would have been filled with sacred olive oil from the groves of Athena near the Acropolis. And the victor lugged it all the way back to Sparta um, and dedicated it to his Athena, to Athena Chalkikos up on the Acropolis. Moving to the second of the, the holy trifecta of temples, we have the sanctuary of Artemis Orthia, um, which is positioned on the bank of the Abrotas River near one of the five Spartan villages or Komai known as Limnai. Um, as you can imagine, it was a particularly marshy area, um, which may explain why the first deity thought to have been worshiped on the site, Orthia, um, later assimilated to the Panhellenic goddess Artemis, was considered to be a goddess of fertility and vegetation. Uh, the number of sources which we have referring to it, as well as the extent of the archeological discover discoveries make it irrefutable um, that it was really central to Sparta's religious uh, and social life. The temple was excavated by the British school at Athens from 1906 to 1910, 1910, sorry. Um, and you can see a photo of this historic excavation at left a bit different from the way excavations are done today. Um, so the sanctuary was established in the ninth century BCE, quite early, um, but we, tell, we can tell this from the dedications. There doesn't seem to have been any structure yet. Um, the first foundations of the first temple appear in 700 BCE. Um, and we also have evidence of flooding in the Avrotas, which caused the sanctuary to have to be rebuilt um, in the late sixth century. So this is a temple that went through various phases, um, also because of its proximity to this body of water. Um, and now what's particular about the sanctuary of Artemis Orthia um, is its link with coming of age rites, both for young boys and for young girls. Uh, the authors Xenophon, Plutarch, and Pausanias inform us of the bloody whipping ritual, the amastigosis, uh, which Spartan youth would have to undergo in front of their peers and the whole community. Both the temple and the ritual of the Amastigosis have a long life. They continued to remain central to Spartan life all the way to the imperial period um, when a theater was actually built around the site, uh, encouraging spectators to view the ordeal um, as a sort of gladiator spectacle um, as our Roman sources describe. And here you can see the re remains of the amphitheater around the older temple structure. Um, as an archaeologist, however, what I find actually most fascinating about the sanctuary are its finds, and there's a lot of them, and they're quite unique. Uh, 
So um, one exceptional group of finds are the ivories. Um, many ivories have been excavated from the temple of Artemis Orthia, starting from around the mid seventh century BCE, slightly earlier. Um, and what's particular about this is that ivory is a luxury material. It's a very expensive material, which would have had to be acquired either from Egypt or from Asia Minor. Uh, the ivories which have been found at Orthia include combs, seals, and relief plaques, one of which you see depicted here. Um, and these could have been fastened to footstools, to furniture, etc. Um, and here we have depicted uh, a male central figure looking out at us, flanked by two females. Um, and the amount of detailing is really remarkable. We can admire the articulation of the hair on the females, uh, the patterning of the clothes, evoking different textures for the viewer, uh, and the number of finds, the number of ivory finds, and their uh, epicoric iconography. So iconography, which is specific to Artemis Orthia, seems to suggest the possible existence of an ivory carving workshop in Laconia, in Sparti. Uh, so we must think of Sparta as a polis during the archaic period as one producing such high quality artistic objects from materials as rare and as exotic as ivory for dedication to their gods. Uh, in contrast to this, we have another group of finds which are characteristic of the sanctuary. And these are the lead figurines. More than 100,000 of these have been found at the sanctuary of Artemis Orthia, and they're now scattered in collections all around the world. The material is in a way the very polar opposite of ivory. It's dark, it's cool, it's extremely heavy, not at all known for its luxurious or beautiful qualities. Um, but here we see it used to make these small everyday dedications, which are spectacularly, spectacularly different from each other uh, in their design. We have winged female goddesses, which have been associated oftentimes with the cult statue of Orthia herself. We have figures dancing, running, animals, gorgon heads, hoplites even. So it's a really versatile iconography, um, which seems to encompass many, many aspects of Spartan life. Uh, and uh, small objects like this are, I think, quite easy to overlook in a museum, but can be most rewarding if one takes the time to look more closely observe the details, think about how they would have been held and how they would have been offered um, in, in, uh, yeah, in what context, with what hopes and dreams or desires in mind. Um, and our final stop on our tour is the Amicleon, the sanctuary of Apollo, um, the third sanctuary, which makes up the Spartan Holy Trinity or trifecta. Um, and I actually had the great pleasure of being part of the excavation team here this past August. Um, so I've spent my whole August working on the site and it's located um, on a hill. Perhaps at this point, you're getting a sense of where the Spartans are likely to build their sanctuaries. Um, and it's located approximately five kilometers south of Sparta, near the modern village of Amicles. Uh, it was associated with the ancient Spartan Komai or village of Amiklai. And from the hill, you have this spectacular view on the Taigetos on the west and Parnon on the east. Uh, when the sun rises, which I've actually had a chance to see as the excavation starts at 6 a.m. to avoid the heat, um, the rays of the sun hit the top of the Taigetos first, painting its peaks in reds and pinks, uh, which always remind me of Homeric rosy fingered dawn, or the Lactile Eos. Um, but the Amicleon is most famous for its throne of Apollo, uh, which was built by Bathocles the Magnesian and described by our friend Pausanias, the second century AD travel writer, in great detail. Um, it's worth thinking about the quote unquote international quality of this artistic work, crafted by an artist from Asia Minor. Um, and this is in addition, of course, to the plethora of mythological scenes which he describes as depicted on the throne. Um, this really secures for me its place as a wonder of the ancient world, uh, wonder and mystery, if you will. So it was said that this statue, 13 meters tall, was built on the hill on top of the tomb of Hyacinthus, uh, the young lover of Apollo, who was killed by a faulty swing of his discus. 
it seems to be the case that Hyacinthus was the first hero or deity to be worshipped on the hill. Uh, and his worship was an associa association with uh, notions of vegetation and rebirth. The festival of the Hyacinthia, held in honor of Apollo Amicleos and his lover, Hyacinthos, was the major religious festival associated with the site, um, linked to youth initiation for the Spartans. And it would have entailed a procession um, from sort of central Sparta, where the other four villages were, all the way um, to the Amicleon. And it would have involved choruses and athletic games um, for young boys and young girls. Uh, so in terms of finds, I'm showing you here on left an object that's displayed in Sparta's archaeological museum. Um, and it's a mixed Doric and Ionic column capital. Um, and I really, I really like this because it's, in addition to being a very fine specimen of Spartan architecture uh, and marble sculpture from the end of the sixth century BCE, I really like the idea of innovation that it captures. Um, so it's not adhering to extant norms in the Greek world, either the Doric or the Ionic. No, it's combining both. And this is something that would have likely been used to decorate the temple of Apollo or the throne. Um, and it's likely or possible that uh, Bathycles was also potentially involved uh, in this innovation. And uh, on the right, you see here a sketching uh, by Catherine de Cancy dating to 1814. And it's his imagination, his imagined rendition of this famous throne of Apollo. Um, described by Pausanias. And it's really fun to share these little drawings because they're always characteristic of the time during which they were etched. Um, there's ones that are from slightly later as well, um, but this very much has sort of the flavor of uh, early 19th century arts. Um, so you have a combination of sort of the ancient evidence um, and the, the, the times of the, the artist, the architect or the archeologist who's looking back. Okay, um, and so with that, I conclude our Betty Gisis, uh, our visit, perhaps not in person, but in mind and in spirit to these magical and mythical sites um, which dot the Avarotas Valley. Uh, and I hope very much to have been able to give you at least a glimpse of what exists, because of course, um, what I've presented is really just uh, the tip of the iceberg uh, in terms of what's actually there. Mm. And I realize I've gone a bit over time maybe at this point. Um, so I'll try to keep the final portion of the presentation short and sweet. Um, but don't let that fool you into thinking it's any less important um, than what I've already presented. Because the final portion of this presentation, what I'm gonna to speak to you about now um, is what's actually being done uh, on the ground in order to make these sites accessible to the public uh, and to the local community. Uh, and in fact, it's quite a lot is being done right now, uh, and it's all very exciting, but there can always be more, uh, especially in the 21st century. And I believe that as lacunas of the diaspora, uh, it's our responsibility to be aware of this uh, and to be vigilant both about protecting and preserving our cultural heritage, but also showcasing it in new and innovative ways. So, I'll speak a bit to the work that's being done by each of these sort of stakeholders, if you will, um, to give you a sense of sort of the, the going ons on the ground. So really important stakeholder is the archeological effort of La Conia, because they're responsible for all of the archeological sites, um, which are located in La Conia. Uh, they're responsible for the rescue excavations, the preservation of monuments and their showcasing. Um, and in recent years, they've really done uh, an exceptional job and particularly on the Spartan Necropolis, um, they underwent a major restoration project, which I think finished in 2014, um, which was focused on making the Acropolis of Sparta visitable. So what they did was they restored a lot of the monuments and you see a photo on right um, of one of these restorations. They put up a fence around the whole site. Um, they put up a sort of tourist booth where one can buy tickets um, and they put up signs um, to sort of guide the visitor um, around the site. And I think this is a really, really important first step to sort of protect the monuments, um, but also to encourage people to appreciate them, to learn about them um, and to integrate them into modern life. So I've taken a couple strolls up to the Acropolis in the past month. 
Um, and it's always really, really lovely to see when tourists are there um, or locals from Sparta taking a stroll um, among the olive trees to look at the ancient sites. Um, next, a really, really exciting uh, project associated with Sparta's ancient theater. So we have Vyazuma Association, uh, which is the citizens movement for the enhancement of ancient theaters in Sparta. Um, and it's directed by a former minister of culture in Greece um, and former mayor of Kalamata, Stavros Bernos, um, who sort of knows the ins and outs of Sparta's uh, Ministry of Culture and Archaeological Services very, very well. Um, and so he had this idea to bring together public and private sector um, around the ancient theaters of Greece, because there's so many of them. Um, every region has so many. Um, and so the idea is that we can come together and work on restoring these, protecting and preserving them, um, but also making them uh, available to the public for uh, key dramatic performances like is done at Epidavros. Um, and so I have the honor and the, and the privilege of serving as Diazuma's Diaz ambassador uh, for the ancient theater of Sparta. Um, and we've managed to raise um, over $200,000 uh, in the past years with the JM Kaplan Fund in New York City uh, and also the Savios Narcos Foundation focused on creating a restoration plan um, with the ultimate goal of getting additional funds to complete the restoration uh, and making integrating the theater back into the daily life of Sparta um, through performances. Uh, and what's recently been announced by Vyazuma, which I also find extremely exciting and extraordinary, um, is this idea of cultural roots. Um, they do them for various regions of Greece, um, but they've just announced that they'll be focusing on the Morea, Laconia next. Um, and so Sparta will be one of the cities, um, one of the poles around which the Morea cultural roots will run, um, which will make it a focus of both cultural heritage, but also local products um, and connect it in general um, into a broader network um, of sites to be visited. So it's all very exciting and, and will be being developed in the coming years. Um, and I encourage you to look at Vyazoma's Facebook page for more information, um, their website, and they also have a wonderful Instagram. Um, and this is a view of the ancient theater of Sparta uh, to travel us all there uh, and imagine what it would have been like. Um, another crucial stakeholder um, is the Stavros Narcos Foundation and their Laconia Initiative. Um, so Narcos is, was from the village of Vambaku. It's not far from my own village, Karia Salahova. And so the Narcos Foundation has particular interest in the sustainable development and sustainable cultural development of Laconia. Um, and there's two really exciting projects which are currently, um, the cogs are beginning to turn. One of these has to do with the Archaeological Museum of Sparta. Um, so I don't know how many of you have visited it, but it's um, a historic museum. It's the first museum to be built outside of Athens. So after the National Archaeological Museum in the Periferia, it was built in 1876. Uh, and that's sort of the historic building, which you see in the photo at left. But it hasn't really changed much since then. Um, so it's, it's a gem in the city and its gardens are also absolutely beautiful, um, but it doesn't really suit the needs um, of the amount of objects that currently exist um, and the desire to display them to the public. So the Nyarkos Foundation has kind of taken it upon themselves to do a renovation of this museum, um, which will be spearheaded by world-class architect Renzo Piano, very, very exciting. Um, and it will preserve, of course, the initial structure, um, but provide more room for exhibition spaces um, and sort of upgrade, upgrade um, the location to make it a hub of uh, cultural life for Sparta. Um, so if you visit in the coming years, perhaps this project will be underway or on the route to being completed. And then on the right, um, we have the famous mosaic of the abduction of Europa, um, which was found on a corner of Paleologu uh, street, the main street of Sparta, um, and is currently not able to be visited by visitors. Um, so it's uh, in a house, but there's no sort of formal way to access it. It's cordoned off. Um, and essentially what the Narcos Foundation has announced is that they're going to make um, a house of Europa to showcase this mosaic. So again, people will, will be able to 
uh, view it, to learn about it, um, to also see the mosaic of Orpheus, which is displayed next to it. Um, and a fun fact is that the two euro coin, um, Greece's two euro coin actually has this exact motif um, from the Spartan mosaic. So that just gives you a sense of its sort of artistic importance. Um, so those two things will be really, really um, exciting and coming up in the coming years. Um, next, I'll speak briefly uh, to a project um, which I'm the founder and director of, the Embracing Our Monuments in Sparta project, um, which I had the pleasure of founding in 2018 um, with students from Yale University and the support of Yale Hellen Hellenic Studies and Yale Classics. Um, and sort of the crux of the idea was recognizing that Sparta has all these sites, um, but they're not really connected. And for someone who's coming to Sparta and has no idea what's there, what to see, what to expect, it's actually, I, I've heard from tourists that it can be quite disappointing because um, they just don't know where to go, how to connect the sites um, in their minds. Um, it's difficult to sort of get a, a sense of the full scope of Sparta's history. Um, if you aren't sort of aware of everything that's there. Um, so essentially the idea, uh, and this was this project was done in collaboration with the archeological service, with Yazuma, um, with the municipality of Sparta and with Greek, Greek American um, Yale students as well as students of classics who wanted to be there on the ground and volunteered to give these, to research and give the tours. Um, and so we had two tours that we created one was called A Journey Through Time, uh, and it started on Sparta's Acropolis, uh, presenting the sites there, um, starting during the archaic and classical period. And it ended up all the way at the Museum of Modern Sparta, um, which very few people know about. And sort of the crux of the idea was to emphasize that Sparta is a palimpest of multiple cities. It's not only Sparta of the 300, um, it's Sparta of many, many different periods. Roman Sparta um, as a tourist destination for wealthy Romans. That's why so many of the mosaics have been found. Sparta thriving during the Byzantine period. Sparta in 1834 founded, the modern city founded upon the ancient city. And so the idea of our tour was sort of to find a way of communicating specialist knowledge, but in an exciting way, encouraging visitors to look for themselves, to think about and to sort of discuss the rich periods of Sparta's history. Um, and we tried to do the same thing in the museum with a tour titled um, The Object Speaks, uh, which again, sort of like the video that I showed you all with um, Leonidas, the so-called Leonidas, which was one of, the, the, one of the objects that we discussed on our tours, encouraging people to really look um, at the objects and see what the objects had to tell them um, with their details and the stories that they told. Um, and so here you can see um, sort of, one of my colleagues, George Gemelas, leading a tour up on the Spartan Acropolis um, with people both from Sparta and from all over the world. Um, I mean, it was really remarkable sort of the turnout um, that we got um, and also the support from the local community. Um, I think the two most heartening things were having people from Sparta come who would tell us, you know, the last time I visited the Acropolis was when I was five uh, or eight with my, the school, with my primary school. I haven't been here since, but thank you so much for giving this tour. I'm learning things that I didn't even know, even though I live here. Um, and so that was really heartwarming to, to, to hear. And I think it really starts to create um, a sort of energy and a dynamism um, also within the local community. Because I mean, these are the people who are living with the monuments um, more than the visitors. Um, but even with the visitors, I think having people coming from all over, over the world, um, in the US, from Australia, from Europe, um, and visiting with Sparta and having you know, young energetic students there to greet them and sort of take them around was also really, really um, exciting and I think valuable and had an impact on a lot of people. Um, and so here you can see, uh, we also did uh, various projects relating, or we also had a focus on local engagement. Uh, so in addition to doing our cultural walks, we did education programs, which you see here on left um, with local children and working with local uh, art teachers as well. Um, we did movie nights, which were focused on uh, films relating to cultural heritage. Um, and we also organized talks, two talks given by Yale professors, Jessica Lamont and Millette Geichman uh, at the Museum of Olive and Olive Oil. Uh, so the idea was to really create an energy 
um, around Sparta's cultural heritage and excitement um, to get people sort of to jolt awake and realize the treasures that they have um, surrounding them, because that's, that's really what they are, um, and they deserve to be showcased in the best way possible. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, another uh, emphasis of our project was that the youth component is really crucial. Um, and uh, there's so many people that we've met um, in Sparta, locals, but um, also Greek Americans, Greek Australians, um, who have a passion for making a difference in this way. Um, so the idea was also to sort of open up the conversation and start the dialogue of what do we want Sparta to look like? What do we want, um, how do we want the monuments to be presented um, and to be preserved sort of for posterity? Um, and these I think are all questions we should be continuing to ask ourselves and think about, um, especially as things are changing in Sparta right now. Um, and I want to conclude by talking um, a little bit about the Amicleon Research Project, which as I mentioned, I was working on this past summer um, for a month. Uh, and uh, what's really exciting about um, the excavation at Amicles is that it has this um, very focused research component. And we've just, um, we're just starting our next five-year cycle um, of excavations where we'll, ac we'll actually be um, continuing outside of the bounds of the hill to sort of see what exists um, in the surrounding area, which is very exciting. Um, it'll be new excavations. Um, but what's really exciting about the Amicleon is its focus as well on public archaeology and outreach um, with the local community. So if you look at this video here, um, it's taken during one of our education programs, which was called Iproti Muanaskafi, uh, my first excavation where local children were able to come um, and learn about the process of being an archaeologist, um, uh, to learn about the techniques, the tools, um, about sort of daily life and archaeological sites, how we get the system up and running, um, what everyone's rules are. Um, um, but yeah, it's really, really exciting to be able to engage with the local community um, in this way. And uh, the Amicleon Research Project will also be entering a period now um, where the archaeological effort will be responsible for turning it into a properly visitable site. Um, so again, when the pandemic is over and you next visit Sparta, please make sure to uh, come and visit. Um, and uh, especially during the summer excavation season, there's always archaeologists there who are willing to give tours. Um, and you can see in the photo um, our excavation team um, on the right. Um, and the other thing that I want to emphasize about the Amicleon is our commitment to new technologies. Um, so the, the video that you saw was taken by a drone. Um, the, this photo is also taken by a drone. Uh, and um, we're also really committed to 3D digitalization of a lot of the objects that we find. Um, GIS and next year we'll also be using uh, geothermal techniques to sort of scope out um, what exists under the ground. Um, so on Amicles, we're very interested in thinking about, again, archaeology in the 21st century. What does it mean? How can we use new technologies to make our process even better um, and to communicate, most importantly, what we're finding um, with the local community? So um, just to conclude, um, for those of you who are interested in supporting cultural heritage in Spadbi. One of the ways that you can do so right now um, has to do with Amicleon and there's the possibility, well, first of all, to visit the site and it will always be our pleasure um, to give tours whenever you do, if we're there and excavating, um, but also you can sign up to be a member of the Friends of Amicleon. Um, so you'll, gain, you'll have information about any conferences, um, any events that we're hosting. There's events that are hosted in Sparta all throughout the year, tours, um, education programs, etc. Um, and I should also note that we are actively seeking donations for our next five excavation and research cycle, um, which I should emphasize is really exciting and we're all very much looking forward to it. Um, but it's the sort of thing that can't happen um, without financial support. So if, if you're feeling generous, um, think this is something important and a worthy cause, then feel free to contact me um, and you see my email on the slide or the director of the excavation, Stavros Vizos um, at the Ionian University um, and we can give you further details. Um, and yeah, uh, that's essentially it. I think 
Uh, the last thing I want to say is that we really hope to have the Lacunas of Melbourne um, involved in cultural heritage preservation in the coming years. Um, and it's an honor to be able to give this webinar, um, youth webinar, um, invited by the youth president, Milfiave. So thank you so much, Milfiave, for the generous invitation. Um, and we really hope to be able to be together in Sparta again very soon uh, and to embrace our monuments, the Mimiamas, together. So thank you. Thank you so much, Daphne. That was an amazing lecture. Uh, I can tell how much effort and research you put into it, first of all. Um, but second of all, thank you for taking it a step further, which mm -hmm. is to take your research and your time and actually put it to use in the Patrida in Greece, um, in La Conia. So that's, that's very important as well. So thank you so much for that. Now, I'd like to open up the floor for questions. If anybody has any questions, please type them on the, uh, in the Zoom chat or from the Facebook Live. Um, just a question from Marula um, asking if the presentation is recorded. Yes, it's recorded on Facebook Live. So after the live stream is finished, it'll be for posterity on the Facebook page. Uh, just a question from Andrew. What would be your ideal archaeological discovery in Sparta or the one that you think would have the potential to most change our perspective, Daphne? Um, it's a really good question. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, I think my answer to that would probably be finding a Laconian uh, artistic workshop. Uh, I think that would have the potential to really change um, our understanding of sort of the way that objects are being produced um, and sort of uh, the aesthetics of Sparta and also this idea of Sparta as austere, um, which seems to be something that was really emphasized by later authors, especially with regards to the classical period. Um, but the archaeological evidence that we have from the archaic period, at least, seems to speak to a very different story. Um, but I think finding a Laconian workshop would really um, allow for this narrative to be complicated and allow us to think uh, again of exactly what sort of role um, art would have played in Sparta. Uh, another question, rapid fire questions, another a question from Nico. Um, hello, Daphne. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. I had a question for you. Is there a way in which you envision the monuments you present to us could be connected? Is there a route you would recommend for visitors to get the full picture or full scope of Sparta's history? Mm, it's a really good question. Um, so I think in terms of uh, the monuments being connected, uh, I think in an ideal world, <laughs> I think it would be really great for them to be connected by walking um, or bike paths. Because uh, the distances aren't really that much. I mean, Amiklas is five kilometers from Sparta. Um, so I think because the way that they are is they're sort of scattered around um, La Conia and they're on these hills um, and they're all visually connected to each other, but it's not really um, like the Athenian Necropolis where it's sort of like one big thing and you can just go there and get the full picture. Um, I think it would be really uh, exciting to have a sort of uh, a walking path or maybe even bike paths. Um, that would connect them and it would be I think a fun touristic activity um, too but also obviously wonderful for the locals. Um, in terms of a route that I would recommend for visitors, um, I think you have to visit the Acropolis, you have to visit the museum um, and I think now that sort of all these um, new developments are happening I would add Ayos Vasilios and uh, the Amaklan to those as well um, but uh, I think again like a lot of the sites are currently undergoing sort of um, their, uh, what's it called, face, um, their do up, their makeover, whatever. The, a lot of the sites are undergoing their makeover now. So I think um, my emphasis would probably be not to only go to like one time period mm -hmm. to try to get to this broader scope of, of Spartan history. And of course, I didn't even mention Mistras, um, which was, I know was one of the other talks um, that was given earlier. Um, another spectacular example yeah. of Sparta during the Byzantine period. I mean, it's really, it's a UNESCO cultural heritage site. It's just exceptional, so. Yeah. Well, we've had a thank you from Gregory, the founder of GreekAncestry.net, which is a genealogical website for our, our previous lecturer. Um, and speaking of genealogy, actually, I've got a question to ask you, Daphne. Um, mm -hmm. I just came up with it during the lecture. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, a few sites which are in relation to the the Spartans' ancient concept of genealogy, you know, Kiatinthos and um, the Menelaion. Um, mm. 
there was a very famous quote by Robert Fowler, which said that the, uh, the Spartans were a, a hybrid breed, a very rare amongst the Greeks for being able to graft themselves onto almost every single important genealogy in the ancient world. Do mm. you think, so that's Heracles, the Perseids, um, Pelopids, mm. almost all of the major families. In your experience in the archaeology, do you think that that's backed up by the archaeology and, and the monuments around Sparta that they constructed uh, an adequate number of these sanctuaries and sites which reflect their genealogy accurately? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, I, I think that um, we do have a sort of gap in terms of Spartan archaeology um, during the sort of dark ages. Um, after the Dorian invasion or like around um, 10th, 10th century BCE to like 9th, 8th, uh, uh, we don't really have that much. And I think that's sort of the period where um, people are starting to re-inhabit the Spartan Valley and establish themselves as a sort of cohesive, um, establish this cohesive identity. Mm. Um, so I think th th in terms of archeology, span those sites are kind of lacking. Um, and I think it's really hard to tell sometimes from some from um, like votive offerings that are offered, sort of how people think of themselves. It's oftentimes not really made ex explicit. Um, but I think something I will say is that, like even on Anamiklas, the Tom to Hyacinthus, which I mentioned, hasn't actually been found. Um, so I think places like the Menelion kind of bring us closest to giving an image of how they thought of themselves uh, in relations to others. Um, and I also think what's interesting is sort of the myths that Pausanias describes as being associated um, with either Athena Chalkikos um, or the statue of Apollo and Amiklai, um, with King Tindereus, the Lokipidae, et cetera. Um, I think whatever myths Apollos chooses to present um, to others on their major monuments, you can think even of what um, we have on the Acropolis of Athens, birth of Athena, the fight between Athena and Poseidon, um, so, so sort of what they project outwards through their religious art, I think is the best way you know, of telling sort of how, they're, how they want to think of themselves. Mm. That's, that's, an, a, that's an amazing response. And I think it's very poignant because um, like, I think it was Hippias, one of the sophists, sophists mm -hmm. I think he said that when he went to Sparta, the only thing the Spartans wanted to hear was about uh, thesis, about the foundation of cities and about the genealogies mm. associated with that. So that's very, that's very interesting. Um, moving on to another question. Um, we have one from Mark Selleck, who was our previous, one of our previous lecturers as well. Um, with what you know of Sparta and the surrounds from an archeological point of view, do you think this holds true in relation to Thucydides saying, judged by its buildings alone, future generations would underestimate Spartan power? Okay, so, um, sorry, I'm just rereading the question. Um, okay, so I think the, the, the Thucydides 110, um, which is what you're referring to, is really, it's been picked apart by scholars a lot. Um, and I think there's like a lot of things that one has to have in mind when sort of analyzing it. We have to think about sort of where it's positioned in Thucydides' narrative. So the example that he's actually using directly prior to this has to do with the, the fleet that went to Troy. So he's basically using the comparison of Sparta to say, he, he says that the fleet was so great, um, you wouldn't believe it though, because like none of it remains. And so the example that he's using, he then like brings up Sparta. Um, so it's interesting to think about like the Mycenaean fleet, Thucydides wouldn't have seen it, it's kind of legendary. Similarly, we don't know how much of Sparta Thucydides actually saw. Um, and I think that obviously like he has a proclivity towards Athens um, and sort of the way that he portrays his narrative and the juxtaposition, you could even say that in a way he's poking fun at Athens for being overly ostentatious. I mean, think about Athens and the Periclean building project um, during the Peloponnesian War um, or like directly before. I think um, you can kind of read it both ways. You can read it as Sparta being austere. You can also read it as Athens being overly ostentatious, which they were. I mean, they flaunted their peacock feathers. They had all this amazing, nice marble, like, you know, but ultimately they were um, like imperial, part of an imperialist democracy and they were forcing people to give them the money to do this. Um, so I think there's, there's oftentimes a bit of irony in Thucydides. I think we can't always take him at face value, but nonetheless, I do think his statement is prophetic in the sense that when you go to Sparta today, 
you look at the ruins, they don't seem to speak to her power. Um, when you look at the Acropolis, you're amazed and you think, wow, this was the peak of um, sort of the peak of culture, the peak of wealth, the peak of power for Apollos. It's very self-evident. Um, but I actually think that um, the number of sites in Sparta that exist and also the fact that a lot of them haven't been excavated can definitely change this picture and sort of uh, prove Thucydides uh, wrong once and for all, if you will. Mm. Well, that's right. You're hundred percent correct in that Athens was a, an imperialist democracy in the sense that the Acropolis and the Parthenon were built on the backs mm -hmm. of all those little tiny islands in the Aegean paying mm -hmm. all their taxes. That's hundred percent correct. Um, we have another question from Rosemary. Um, have you had anything to do with the sunken city uh, off the Laconian coast opposite Eleponisos? Ah, Pavlo Petri. Um, haven't had anything to do with it in terms of scholarly work, but I've visited it twice um, and gone snorkeling and sort of tried to search for um, the roads. There's a really good BBC documentary that sort of describes the history of the site. Um, in terms of cultural heritage preservation, this is an example where I think that the site should be sort of a formal ticket, play, ticket paying thing where you go, you can get snorkel equipment, it's protected, um, and you can go and kind of have an excursion. Um, but right now it's sort of a free for all. So a lot of people just, you know, perch on the beach there and go and snorkel and look at the ruins in their, in their spare time. It's really lovely, I would recommend it. Well, I haven't been, so I'll have to add that to my list. Um, <laughs> Litza, a question from Litza. Um, thanks Daphne for a really interesting presentation. Just wondering, what is the biggest contribution that archeology span makes to our understanding of modern culture? Mm. It's a very big one. It's a very big one. Um, I think um, a lot of the, I think, okay, I think fundamentally it's a question of sort of uh, society and identity in the sense that the way that our societies are built today are fundamentally modeled on ancient Greek policies, ancient Greek texts, and this ancient Greek way of thought. That's why it's the pillar, the foundation of Western sort of democracy and culture. I mean, I think even in ways that maybe now in the 21st century, we don't directly recognize, I think that this is, necess this is the case. Um, but I think in terms of the biggest contribution that archeology span makes, I don't know about the contribution that archeology span makes um, to modern culture. I would say maybe a source of inspiration um, also a source of humbling to remind us that we're not the only ones that are here. There were people here before us. Um, I think it's always like the moment of an archaeologist where you find an object and you hold it in your hands for the first time and think about that this was used by someone 2,500 years ago. You're not the first human to touch this. Um, I think that is like quite, it's really humbling and it gives you a sense of sort of like uh, human heritage and time and sort of all these bigger um, philosophical questions that I feel like are maybe not asked too often today. Um, so yeah, I think I think the contribution is just, um, it's like a fundamentally hum humanist one, um, sort of one both of seeking to, under seeking to understand ourselves by looking at the way that others lived in the past. That's a very thorough, I think, I think you touched on a lot of good points there. I mean, uh, I agree completely. And I think that being Greek and Hellenism in general, mm -hmm. it's not some distant, vague abstract to a lot of us. Uh, mm -hmm. If we consider ourselves a living part of a living culture, then it has a lot of significance, I guess, the archaeology, the material culture, because uh, we, we, we can draw a line back, no matter how uh, broken the chain is, we can draw a line back to them. And we, and we, we associate strongly with them. So I, I can see exactly where you're coming from. Um, another question now from Theo, Theodore. What is the current condition of the theater of Sparta? Is there a predi prediction of when it will be restored to a point suitable for use for public events? Um, so the current condition is that essentially the, the architectural plan for its restoration has been made and it's been approved by the Ministry of Culture. Um, and last summer, the archeological service began to do some preliminary excavations which are needed um, in order for the plan to sort of continue. Um, it's now been, it's now entering sort of the next five year ESPA grant, which is the European Union grants, um, which are directed towards culture. And so my guess would be that over the next five years, um, these projects will sort of be ongoing. 
um, and hopefully by the end of that period, um, it would be ready um, for suitable use. But I think these things are quite difficult to predict um, just in terms of coronavirus, Greece, um, and everything. But I think that would sort of be the ideal timeline. Well, we will have two quick questions and then we'll finish up. Um, a question from um, Victoria. Hi, Daphne, where would you visit first if you wanted to discover Laconia? Um, discover in terms of archeologically or? I, I, I can only assume that she means any site, any monument. Um, I think, Mm, that's that's a really tough one. That's a broad there's just one. so there's just so many that I think whichever one you choose, you will get a really clear picture. Like even we didn't even talk about like Monemboscia, Tenaro, uh, and the sort of the mosaic and temple to Poseidon that exists there. Um, there's even sites within Sparta that I didn't touch on. There's a Byzantine neighborhood that's located slightly um, west of the of the sorry, of the stadium. Mm. Um, there's so many uh, like Roman mosaics, which are not on display, but which are in the, the basements of a lot of buildings. So I think it's really, really hard to choose one. Um, so I'm, I, I can't answer the question, sorry. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Well, well, this will be our last question then from Peter. Uh, my new favorite academic, the dominant theme in Spartan architecture is religiously driven. Their general narrative is of a pious people. In your experience in regards to archeology, span is this a unique narrative? Or is it typical mm. for most of the Greek world? Mm. Um, well, the Spartans were known for being exceptionally pious. Um, that's what our literary sources tell us. It's what Thucydides tells us. Um, and uh, so I think that actually it's an interesting way to sort of approach um, Spartan way of thought. If we think about the fact that they were so religious, then perhaps looking at their religious dedications to their deities, to their gods, um, which were so central to their religious and social life, would give us the best picture um, of them. And I think in terms of whether that applies to other polis, um, certainly in the sense that uh, temples um, oftentimes serve as the richest source um, of sort of information uh, about any polis um, in the Greek world. But I think maybe if we think about um, Athens, there's a way in which Athens' religious life, at least in the popular, quote unquote, popular narrative, gets overshadowed by um, her democratic institutions. And that's something that's not really the case for Sparta. And also, we have no civic buildings preserved in Sparta uh, that have prov proven to be used um, for civic purposes, which I also think is interesting because maybe it's used the narrative for us the other way maybe we are misled into thinking that Sparta is overly pious because we only have remains from temples. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that that's sort of a way that one has to be careful with archeology span um, as a scholar, because um, you have to recognize that it's providing you a very specific fragment, a very, very specific snapshot, snapshot um, sort of of what's going on. Um, and so I think it's always good to be cautious and think about these things when crafting a narrative. Um, yeah. Um, well, thank you so much, Daphne, for answering all those questions. The links to the Azuma, Embracing Our Monuments in Sparta, and the Amiklaion project will all be on the Palaconian Facebook page. So I'd like to thank you so much for your time and effort, Daphne. And I'd like to thank all of our listeners as well. And I'll be bringing the uh, Zoom lecture to an end. Thank you so much.